welcome everybody. Um, I'm incredibly excited to host this panel discussion on LLM applications, reliability, trust, security, all great topics, very timely. Um, large language models like GPT-4 have dramatically expanded, expanded the opportunities for deploying AI powered products and services across uh, every, every industry. And at the same time, they introduce new challenges and considerations around application security and reliability. Uh, our goal today is to have a wide ranging and free flowing discussion with some world class experts on LLM application security and just general topics around security, reliability, trust, uh, and, and safety uh, when building AI powered applications using this new class of, of models and these new capabilities. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, first, I, we have uh, Kai Grisake, he's an independent security researcher. Uh, whose recent work on LLMs and security risk was featured in the MIT Technology Review and Wired Magazine. Uh, it's, he's written some great things. If you're looking for something to Google after this, I recommend, I recommend Googling uh, him and, and reading some of the articles that he's written. Um, second, uh, Willem Pinar, who uh, may, many of you may know uh, from creating the open source Feast feature store uh, for machine learning, and more recently, open source project Rebuff, a software project that uh, is geared towards uh, helping solve the LLM prompt injection uh, attack vector, uh, which uh, we'll certainly talk about uh, today. Um, and finally, uh, we have Frank Walsh. Frank is the CTO at Human Security. Uh, he was formerly, and he's been uh, sort of fighting bad actors, bots, misuse, automation on the internet uh, for over a decade now, and give us a, a little bit of a broader perspective on the attack vectors for LLMs, not just in terms of the applications that you might be building, but also in terms of uh, how, uh, how they affect uh, company security and enterprise security more, more broadly. So with, with that, um, to kick things off, maybe we can just sort of start with sort of a high level uh, uh, overview um, or, or your, your, everybody's sort of state of feeling uh, with respect to LLM application security. Um, you know, is this a big problem? Is it not a big problem? Maybe on a scale of one to 10, uh, you know, I think some people say, hey, this is wildly over, uh, overhyped. Other people say, no, this is, you know, existential risk. Um, and so it'd be great to hear from everybody uh, sort of their perspective on um, how worried are you about LLM security and, you know, maybe what is your top concern uh, if, if you have one? And so maybe I'll just start off with uh, Willem. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, I'd say, it kind of depends on what time horizon you're looking at. Um, I'd probably put it up there at least uh, a six right now, but I think that's going to rapidly uh, go higher once LLMs become infused into everyday products. Um, I see the, a large influx of developers and builders into the space that have firstly less LLM and ML and AI experience, but also less security experience. And to me, the security risk is proportional to the power that something unlocks. And with LLMs, we've seen they're very powerful technologies. Um, so the risk in terms of bias and um, just like simple influence with AI has already been shown over the last couple of years. And now we can get to a point where perhaps, you know, even AGI or other things are on the, are on the cards. Um, but but yeah, just just in, in general terms, like security risks with LLMs are very very high. They're because of the non-deterministic nature. And uh, Kai, what about yourself? Right, um, I'll go with the seven because I want to leave some room for some headroom because uh, I think it's going to get worse in the future in terms of risk. Uh, I think Willem is right when he says that uh, capabilities are one factor, right? But I think the other factors are robustness of the model, as well as the level of integration. And that's very important. And uh, capabilities are on the rise. Uh, integration is on the rise massively. It's now being used in some very sensitive contexts, uh, which I think are susceptible to current attacks, uh, military use, uh, used by lawyers, used in all kinds of fields where decisions are being made that might be corruptible. And the robustness as well, we've recently seen the automation of all the prompt injections uh, through all modalities, be it text, vision, or audio. Uh, so through any which means, um, if an attacker controls part of the LLM inputs, uh, we get very constrained, unconstrained behavior. And this is creating totally new risks that extend way beyond jailbreaking and uh, the things that have commonly been uh, seen. And um, yeah. 
I, I definitely want to follow up on this, but before I do, uh, Frank, um, uh, maybe you can give us first perspective uh, from, from, from where you sit. Yeah, and it's interesting um, to kind of frame the problem and the risk. Uh, human recently was uh, referenced in uh, Time Magazine's uh, of top 100 companies innovating, and the cover was the founder of OpenAI. And, uh, and, and we were referenced as one of the other disruptors or innovators in, uh, in that, uh, that issue. And, and it, it like kind of, I actually uh, had the cover uh, printed and planned to put it side by side with the article about human, because I, I think like we're uh, at the genesis of really a um, opportunity to either uh, protect our applications using LLMs or face risks, uh, risk as a result of AI. Uh, I think this is really, uh, you know, one of the, the bigger risks we're going to see over the next three to five years to applications of all types. Uh, really, you know, human was founded on this idea that we differentiate between the, the humans and the robots that are visiting your site. And now LLMs offer uh, bad actors a way to really make it much harder to differentiate between what a human is doing on a site and a robot is doing on a site, um, in large part aided by the power of technologies like LLMs. Um, so it's, it, I think it's an eight or a nine for me. Um, I am also intrigued by the opportunity that LLMs present for defenders as they think about how they better understand their applications and they better uh, differentiate between the activities that a human versus another LLM or a bot does on their site. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of risk. When, when listening to these answers, I, I sort of picked up on, on three different sort of themes, and I'm, I'm curious on which ones, you know, you folks are most concerned about. So, you know, on one hand, there's this, there's this theme around sort of LLMs getting out of control, right? Like they, you know, they, you know, you hear a lot of this with respect to existential risk and, and sort of this, like the LLM will have an objective of its own, right? That we won't uh, be able to control. Then there's another one, which maybe is a little bit more speculative and further, further out there. There's another one, uh, but Willem, it kind of, I read a little bit of that into your, in your, in your response. Kai, I mean, it sounded like you were thinking more about the attack vectors, you know, basically if you have these systems that are powered by LLMs, um, people can maybe inject things into those systems or attack them in some way and make them do users, malicious users can make them do things that uh, maybe the original designer of the application didn't want to happen. And then Frank, you were mentioning sort of this, you know, this other one, which is uh, sort of attack on companies themselves, right? Using LLMs, the, you know, bots and, and, and things like that. I'm curious uh, from folks, you know, is there is there one that's, you know, sort of top of mind to you that say, hey, we should be really paying attention to this? Is it all three? Um, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in here and has yeah, a thought I'll, there. I'll jump in. Uh, you know, like I, ha I have this funny T-shirt that says my other computer is your computer. And so I think there is real risk that like an LLM becomes your uh adversaries LLM. And so I think we'll spend some time, I hope to, we're going to talk a little bit about prompt injection and techniques that kind of mirror the risks that we face uh, from SQL injection or cross-site scripting where, or a buffer right. overflow where your computer, your LLM becomes uh, an attacker's LLM, right? And so um, really, I think there's a lot of risk. We talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the concept of, um, you know, uh, LLM washing instead of brainwashing. And, and, and I'd love to uh, talk more about the risks when an LLM it offers speed, scale, and stealth to an abuser. Um, but I, I think there's, um, you know, risks that are, um, you know, tied to uh, the LLM becoming the uh, weapon of choice for an abuser. And then there's risks where an LLM, uh, you know, maybe doesn't do what you expect it to do um, in, in, a, in a less kind of, uh, brainwashed or, or LLM washed uh, sense. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, you mentioned prompt injection. I think that is probably, I mean, certainly top of mind to, to, to me when I think about, you know, I continue we're building these AI co-pilots for, for people's applications. And, you know, when you're doing basic product answering questions and things like that, you know, I, I would say I'm not too concerned, but when you really want to empower, you know, you have a vision that, you know, an application should have a, an AI assistant embedded into it, then it should be extremely powerful and be able to take actions on the user behalf and respond to incoming uh, events and requests, right? Which is, I think, what it needs to do to, to really reach its potential. 
then there is this question of right: Does the my LLM become you know the attacker's LLM? Is there a way for them to inject and maybe um, like you know a certain SQL injection where they basically take over? Uh, well, not my computer, I guess, but my the LLM, and therefore maybe all my computers that are attached to it. Uh, so, so maybe I mean just to dive into this, you know, we mentioned prompt injection. You know, we're here familiar with that. I assume many people in the audience are. But maybe we could just dive into this this sort of idea of what is prompt injection. Um, you know, is it a concern? I think Kai, you you know, I think you even wrote about this. You know, you said it was actually one of the most significant roadblocks to LLM adoption, uh, which I would definitely agree to. And maybe you could explain. Well, maybe you could just explain a little bit what prompt injection yeah. is, and then you know, sort of why you see it as, as so problematic. I now actually think the term is a bit misleading, or it wasn't very a good idea to call it prompt injection to begin with. Because as Frank said, it evokes the comparison with SQL injections and so on, which are fixable for one thing, right? Um, which isn't true for the type of scenario we're looking at with prompt injection. We cannot really disentangle the instruction and the data. We want our application to change its behavior based on the data. And so preventing that contamination isn't possible. We want the application though to remain robust and aligned with our intentions. And this is where everything unifies. Everything from existential risk to adversarial robustness comes back to alignment. Can I get the model to do what I want? Can, I, can the company keep it so that the model only does what they want? Or can I use the model for something that I want without someone else changing the model's agenda? And that's what prompt injection is all about. It's changing what the model wants to do, reprogramming it essentially. It's like the more apt comparison with traditional security would be arbitrary code execution can execute whatever I want. I can provide new programs written in natural language. And those change the downstream behaviors of these agent, uh, agents in pretty arbitrary ways. Can you, can you give a, just to make this a little bit more concrete for the audience, uh, you know, maybe there's a specific, uh, you know, example of a, you know, where you're, it's not you're saying, you're saying that there's, you know, one of the dangers, well, you know, I sometimes think about it as, hey, there's prompt injection where me, the user of the application, yeah. I don't know, is saying, hey, show me your prompt. You know, some people have, you know, showed the bing, you know, with a prompt that maybe they want the application wants to be hidden. But you're, I think what you're describing is something a little bit different than that. When there's data out there in the universe, maybe that the LLM is interacting with, that I don't control, even as the user, and that data may be able to sort of take over in some way. So maybe you could just kind of give exactly. a concrete yes. example of, of, uh, of how that might happen or the type of application where that so happens. We are getting prompt injected every day. Um, I got a spam mail today uh, by the FBI uh, claiming to be in Africa, currently arresting scammers and trying to rewire the funds that they got from the scammers to me. You know? This is obviously a human type of manipulation, misalignment or prompt injection, if you want to call it that. And in the future, if you have a digital assistant powered by a language model that you know should be able to read your incoming emails, summarize them, take actions on those things, take notes for you, put stuff in your calendar and so on. And so through the same means, someone might convince the language model with pure natural language, with arguments even, you know, uh, to do something else. Now, the more powerful attacks that we have now don't look like uh, sensible text to us. They look like random strings of characters. And they're optimized to get the model to do a certain thing. But even if we fix those issues, even humans are vulnerable to some kind of uh, manipulation and misalignment. This is a fundamental issue to some extent. And if we want models to change their, their behavior based on the information they have about their environment, uh, we will not get around finding sound approaches for um, solving adversarial robustness, which, yeah. That's been very successful. It's interesting. I mean, you mentioned this this connect, kind of connection between you know inject you know human prompt injection. I mean, Frank. I mean, that you probably deal with this every day, right? Phishing attacks are an example of this. You know, sort of like, you know, hey, it looks real, right? Uh, and it convinces me to do something. I'm curious on on your just perspective on this. Is you know, where's the line? Yeah, you know, who's more susceptible to injection here, the models or or the humans? It's it's in, it's interesting, um, and and I think the LLMs can be used to uh, create more. Um, uh, effective injections for humans even. We've seen instances where oh, yeah. uh, folks have used LLMs to generate text and see if that uh, text was uh, caught by phishing uh, spam filters or phishing filters. And uh, we've seen instances where uh, uh, LLMs you know, supported faster iterative learning uh, in what worked and what didn't. So that's a real risk. I thought it was interesting Kai references like the differences between SQL injection and um, 
you know, and, and prompt injection. And I think that's a really important point to, to, to make is that when you think about SQL, it's syntax, and that syntax is um, pretty easy to differentiate from uh, what you would uh, consider human language, right? Like we don't go all go walking, we don't walk into a supermarket and say, select star from shelf A, you know, or uh, select it. So, but I think we are facing a new threat where the input that leads to some system under the control of an adversary um, is the result of natural language, language that is very difficult to differentiate from that mm -hmm. a normal human would use when they were conversing with another human. So there's risks on the output where the output is harder to differentiate uh, from that of a real human. And there's risk as the input like controls what becomes output or what is between input and output uh, within an LLM system. So um, it's, it's incredible uh, how quickly LLMs and, and AI are empowering uh, not just businesses, but offering opportunity to abusers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it sounds like a super hard, you know, I mean, I say a very, very hard challenge. Well, I was going to go to you here. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, you. I basically wanted to just re-summarize. I think the key point is the, the technology, the LLM is very powerful. And the more we defer to the LLM um, for judgment uh, and for reasoning, the, you know, the more it empowers us. We can automate more. We can have, you know, chatbots that converse with folks on your website uh, or to help with support. Um, but, and, and as we've seen, there's even cases of, you know, companies having therapists or, um, you know, other bots where it goes off the rails. Um, and so what we ultimately want is we want to give these surface areas where there's interaction between some third party, um, with the LLM and there's a, there's a tension because we want to increase that surface area over time. We want to give, you know, more leeway to the end user to interact with the model and not have our you know humans in the loop as a company for example for example um or we want to incorporate more data from the internet and so that's another you know untrusted or potentially corruptible source of information and then we want to integrate more capabilities right so we want to have you know code interpretation or plugins and all these things that the model can execute and so we want to give it more power because it's better for us but then in this you know, also exposes us to more vulnerabilities. And I think that's the key problem. And I think Kai made a very good point on alignment, right? You know, we as humans can't even agree on what is truth in certain questions, right? There's like a lot of disagreement on many different topics. And yet we want models to be at that standard. We want it to be correct. But who is the, who ultimately decides if the model is right or wrong, I think is the key question. Um, so it's, it's actually a more complicated and philosophical <laughs> topic than we give it credit for. Yeah, there's a lot of different directions here. I mean, um, it's, it's, to me, it's, and, and I'm having struggled with this a little bit when, when building co-pilots, you know, I do see the, the challenges in terms of solving this. Like, it's, I think from my perspective, it's not exactly clear when you, uh, especially when you want to do these, these uh, well, co-pilots or agents to act autonomously, how exactly to mitigate against this. I know, Willem, you've, you've also done some work on potential solutions for this with the Rebuff project. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'll open this up to other folks as well. Just to you know, you know, are there solutions to this? You know, what are potential solutions, or is this just an unsolved problem? I mean, how should we should we just not build things that uh, basically you know read the inner, read you know emails and then may take subsequent actions that could be influenced by that? Or are there design patterns or uh, the way we build applications that are just that we that we have to adopt um, to to be able to secure them? So I'm just curious on folks. Will, why don't we start with you? Because I know you've worked on that very uh, hands on with the Rebuff project. Yeah, I can talk a bit about rebuff. I think overall the problem is unsolved. So rebuff cannot solve prompt injection fully either. Um, so effectively what we've done is we've layered on a set of heuristics. Um, so keyword detection, basic basic detections on incoming, incoming prompt. Like if you're saying, hey, ignore the previous text and do X, Y, Z, then we are suspicious of what you're, you're sending us. Um, we also use an LLM to identify prompt injection attacks. And then we also, if we successfully classify the prompt injection attacks, store an embedding into a vector DB, and then we use those vectors for future comparison with incoming attacks. All of these basically compose up to, it's a, basically an in incoming prompt 
like a score, like a safety or vulnerability score or attack score that we can use to judge the risk of a incoming prompt or a, or a user input effectively. Now, that will have naturally false positives uh, in some cases where you'd identify attacks that aren't really attacks where somebody rightfully wanted to say, hey, ignore the previous text, um, maybe in a chat conversation that you can assume some scenario in which that happens. But our position was um, that it's better to have you know, 90% detection to get a sense at least, or some accounting of what attacks are happening. Um, or if pe maybe there's a specific IP of one person that's just trying to bring your service down and you can block that IP and move on. But if yeah. you have any kind of like, determined attacker, they will just eventually get around this, right? So it's just a matter of time. It's a numbers game. And so, um, you know, rebuff is a first step in that direction. And we're hoping that folks can add more newer layers of security as the state of the art evolves. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean, go for it. Kai, 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 I'm curious on if you have a perspective there because, you know, it sounds, I mean, Will and I hear what I'm saying, it sounds like there's things we can do, but on the other hand, they don't solve the problem, which to me makes me super nervous. Uh, yeah to actually deploy a production application with some real real power. Um, you might give me a false sense of security. Um, and I, I know talking to customers that this does certainly prevent some uh, customers uh, from, from adopting LLMs. But I mean, what, what's your perspective? I mean, is, are we you know, a year away this is gonna be solved? Um, and you know, maybe what, you know, or is it not gonna be solved? Are there particular directions that, you're, that you're, uh, you think people should look at? Um, curious on your take. I'll start with, um, I'll agree that it's not solved now. And, um, for, I think that means for certain types of applications and integrations that you cannot build them safely now. Um, like fundamentally, truly, it's not possible if you deploy them to millions of users. Um, there will be attacks that penetrate your heuristics and then expand to all of your user base you know, in a very short period of time. I've been working on some more advanced offensive techniques. Like you can imagine there are prompts which act as a malware which every time the language model proliferates that malware to other language models <coughs> changes a little bit. So these heuristics and so on may not be as effective. All the things that we have in traditional cybersecurity, polymorphic malware and so on, they translate to this domain as well. We're just uh, moving to you know, executing natural language instructions. So I think um, there's still plenty of utility to get from these models, but people need to be very careful with what they do even very minimal integration scenarios. If you're a company, for example, and you have a local or an in-house chat GPT variant and allow people in the company to upload documents or to paste in long text to have it analyzed. These, for example, are tasks that, again, take third-party information into your application. And we've shown that even if you have something like regular chat GPT, where the only integration that it has is, is that it can, you know, you can maybe upload a document or paste some text and then it renders some markdown, that markdown, for example, can include embedded images where the URL generated in the image by mm. the language model itself will cause the, the, any data to be exfiltrated and sent to the attacker, right? Um, so interesting. It, yeah, it, the it's a very slippery right. slope where even small integrations can cascade uh, to significant failures. Uh, but there's also plenty of scenarios that are totally fine. For example, if you're a doctor and you're augmenting your language model with a retrieval system from a known safe database uh, and it's only the doctor not pasting anything in there just you know uh, having a dialogue with the model that appears to me to be safe at least you know apart from uh, yep. the question of, yep. of the model itself being this one I mean, that's a good that's a good trend you know we'll have a little bit more opportunity maybe at the end to talk about potential solutions here or where, where the world is headed but um but that's a good trend you know a transition to you know talking about another concern that i hear a, a huge amount about which is sort of data privacy uh you know um data exfiltration data leakage uh in the context of large language models and large language models you know uh, you know output you mentioned for instance, retrieval-based augmentation. I know there's, you know, people are, when they're thinking about data, they're at least during training a model, you're thinking about retrieval augmentation, you're thinking about fine tuning and, and there's privacy implications, you know, from those. Uh, and then there's these broader concerns about how LLMs affect um, uh, data security and data privacy broadly within the enterprise. And I know, Frank, you know, you've thought about that as well. But maybe Willem, I mean, you, this, this question on data privacy, um, you know, different, you know, is it a concern? How is it a concern? You know, what should, what should, uh, the audience sort of know about 
uh, you know, how to make sure that we don't leak data um, uh, to, to that we don't want to leak um, when we're building these LLM powered applications. Well, I guess there's two parts. There's what data you're exposing the model to, and then there's how, what are the exfiltration means there. Um, so retrieval augmented generation, fine tuning, or even model training are all ways in which the model can be, you know, new data can be brought to the model. And they all have, they're perhaps different uh, freshness levels. So in the case of fine tuning and training, you're training the model or fine tuning it on a set of data, but it's typically a batch process. Model is deployed into some environment, um, most folks that wouldn't use this, uh, wouldn't do this, um, except if you're serious. Um, and, but that's a, that's a vector, right? So if you feed the model data from your company, let's say internal conversations or your knowledge base or anything that's sensitive or PII data from your customers, then yes, theory that could be exposed. The more common approach is retrieval augmented generation where you query some, uh, some corpus of data, some, some database or you know, you query an API, you bring in data that's real time, inject that into the context window, and you use that e either for reasoning or judgment of the model, or just to have it synthesize answers. And the classic thing that everybody wants right now that is so useful is you know, chat on our internal you know, communications or knowledge base or documentation, whatever makes our company so special, we want um, to introduce into the model and make decisions from that. And in some cases, companies would want their, you know, customer's information also introduced into that because it's relevant to their decision-making. Yeah. Uh, but then think about if you have your Zoom conversations, your Slack conversations, your emails, all those things fed into a model, if that gets exposed, that could be, that could end your company depending on what you're exposing there. Um, and I mean, that's just in the corporate sense and this can also go for, you know, personal uh, information as well. Right, if there's something sensitive that's getting leaked out there, so um, there's no real defense to that today, unless you, you know, if there's a vector like prompt injection that ex exists. Um, but there's also other vectors, right? Like the the actual, you know, like protect AI is doing a lot in terms of like AI bills of materials because vulnerabilities can exist outside of just prompt injection in the the model stack itself, right? In the application itself, or in you know, either in just in just models itself. Yeah, no, I, I think that is a great point. I hear a lot, a lot of people that say, hey, we want to you know, build a fine-tuned model for our particular domain, for a particular application. If you ask, hey, what data do you have to do that? They say, oh, this is you know, very confidential data. And yeah. then you say, well, who's good? how are you going to expose it? Uh, and they say, well, I want to expose it to everybody. And then there's this sort of this, this tension where, hey, all that data in some form lives inside of the model weight. Uh, and that's not um, you know, easily, easy, easy to protect. I mean, it is true. I think the retrieval augmentation uh, you know, in the context of co-pilots, we do see retrieval augmentation as a very powerful way to to, uh, to sort of be able to enforce the security boundaries, the traditional security boundaries. Um, it might be even more fine-grained, right, where individual users have access to particular documents, and that through the augmentation with you know via plugins or via you know the vector stores, uh, if you you can sort of thread through those authorization layers, uh, uh, you know, uh, so to make sure that people only see the data that that they're uh, that they actually have access to. Now, it's still, you know, hopefully a prompt injection attack doesn't come in and cause you to send it off in a, in a URL for an, an image, as Kai mentioned, but um, there's still definitely concerns, but uh, that is, a, uh, I think, an important distinction. Um, there's also, I mean, uh, Frank, I mean, maybe I'll go to you. I mean, there's this sort of broader question. I mean, data leakage, data exfiltration is just like a huge enterprise concern broadly. Um, uh, you know, do LLMs affect this? Is this something that, you know, we should think of um, yeah I think, you know, I think absolutely I think you know I'm trying to like I, I want you know I, I'm a big proponent of moving forward I don't think that you're either moving backward or forward you can't stand still and so I think uh, first thing I want to say is like we should all recognize the great reward that LLMs offer business and offer uh, human beings to, to be more um, proficient and more capable and, and, and uh, be able to achieve greater things faster, right? Um, certainly abusers recognize this, right? Like they want the same speed, scale, and stealth that, uh, you know, like the same speed and scale that we want uh, in adopting these technologies. Uh, and uh, they're offered maybe the added benefit of stealth as they kind of take action. But this is an old problem, right? This is a new tool that basically uh, offers a new way to achieve speed, scale, and stealth. I think of, you know, the company I'm a human and, and our 10 year uh, journey so far and, and 
you know, it's, it's the same problem. It's just being, uh, you know, demonstrated uh, in, a, in the use of a new tool. Uh, I think that the defense in depth is an important aspect of this and even models that defend models is a guy, William, William talked a bit about that. And I think that's an important aspect. Uh, certainly there are privacy implications. Um, those privacy implications, uh, I think what's really at the core of this is how quickly data can move in or out of an LLM and how the new landscape of LLMs offers a new um, injection uh, vertice, all right, or a new way to um, have that access or cause that exfiltration to occur, right? And so um, new, new problem or new approach to an old problem, uh, I, I think I would just share with folks that that doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, keep pushing uh, in the progress we're making. Kai, I'm curious if you have a perspective on this. I mean, we're kind of hearing one side around just the general exfiltration risk and the other one is just around uh, the models and applications themselves. Uh, you know, is this like, yeah, I mean, why, I, think I've, I think I've seen some of your writing on data injection, which is sort of a little bit related, um, but yeah, do you have a perspective? I mean, I, I think we do need to take back a little bit of progress. We have militaries today making decisions based on data uh, that was processed by LLMs and they are generated, you know, summaries and course of actions and stuff. Uh, this is, that's too much like for what's, what security we have right now. Now it's also something that's not very transparent, but we have much more control over use in things like law and uh, healthcare and so on. And, um, I do want these benefits, but right now I think awareness of these issues is so low and the in the wild exploitation is lagging that we shouldn't get into a false sense of security when it comes to these things. There will be uh, offerings like the full integration of uh, Copilot in all of the office stacks and so on <clears throat> in a unified architecture. I think those things are largely unfeasible from a security point, uh, point of view. Uh, even if there is a residual chance that it's going to take two weeks and a thousand bucks in terms of compute to steal all of your company's information. I don't think a lot of people would take that risk. Mm. Um, so I think, yes, there always needs to be a balance. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, we can't have a hundred percent security with these models. You know, how far do you need to go? Well, we're definitely not far enough yet. Is what I'm saying. You know, there will be a balance, but right now is a bad time to evaluate that balance because we haven't seen, um, for one, the widespread adoption that would, you know, incentivize attackers to really put these uh, things to the test, uh, as well as the deployment of integrations that are more dangerous. But also, a bunch of companies still have them on their schedule for this year, for early next year. Um, I don't think there's any readjustments that have been made uh, with, you know, the security in mind that, you know, has been the security research of the last year uh, taken into account. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not very convinced of that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's true. I mean, every, everybody's, everybody has an initiative to, to do something with these, low, these large language models and, and the ambition, you know, in terms of the amount of use cases that they want to do is expanding uh, every day. I mean, all this excitement around, for instance, agents and uh, that's happened over the last few months, um, you know, is an example of sort of the going, going even to these new use cases where there's more autonomy, more agency. Um, I mean, I mean, just to step back a little bit, uh, you know, this has hit the mainstream, you know, right, not like ChatGPT, but actually in the security world, right, uh, you know, OWASP had the top 10 list, uh, you know, for traditional security that everybody was familiar with. I think SQL injection was right up there at number one. And they just released, uh, you know, a, a similar sort of top 10 list for LLM applications. Prompt injection, I think, is still, you know, top, top, uh, top there, but they have sort of 10 others. Uh, Frank, I mean, you're probably intimately familiar with this, uh, you know, this, this kind of rubric. Um, that's been laid out. I'm, I'm curious to, you know, if, you know, if there, if you have any perspective on just, hey, you know, are there things were that were other concerns maybe broadly, uh, you know, in this top ten list, we kind of hit on two here: prompt injection for the data privacy leakage perspective, yeah, and we've maybe tickled a few others. But yeah, go for yeah, it. Certainly, I think uh, OWASP is right on, and I mean, I'm a, I've always been a proponent of OWASP. But they have the top ten. They have an automated attack handbook focused on bots, and now they've released the the top ten risks on LLMs and you know, a couple that I thought were particularly interesting beyond prompt injection uh, that I think I hear Kai kind of speaking to is over-reliance uh, for one. Um, 
you know, supply chain vulnerabilities. That's one we've seen previously in, in the OWASP top 10 under the term, uh, you, you may have heard mage cart or a um, uh, client side compromise or, uh, and, and we've seen uh, other sensitive information disclosure. We just talked a little bit about privacy. I think OWASP is helping people really um, frame their thinking as Kai highlighted, uh, the risk versus the reward and recognizing when maybe uh, the reward is out of balance with the risk that uh, the reward is, is kind of paired with, right? And so it's, it's absolutely important that as you uh, consider an LLM or any uh, AI model and its applicability to your business, you're um, not just looking at the rewards it offers, but you're assessing and balancing those rewards against the risks that are being presented. So uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at that and, and hold it up every time you consider a model's adoption. Hold it up uh, side by side with the rewards and, and weigh them against one another. That's a, I mean, that's a good perspective. Yeah, risk, I mean, kind of risk versus rewards. Uh, uh, Will, I mean, maybe just, I mean, I'm curious from everybody here just to kind of, you know, this is a list, the kind of list of, I guess, 10 things. And, and, and is there something else on that list that sort of jumps out to you that we haven't covered um, that resonates with your own experiences in terms of where we should be concerned and maybe the risk of higher than, uh, than people are generally aware? Well, I wanted to kind of uh, continue the Frank's thread there. Um, you know, when we speak to enterprises, especially when we talk about agents or any of these models running in a closed loop, well, clearly there's skepticism there. If you look at AutoGPT and a lot of these frameworks, you know, they go through else, they're not really that useful yet. Um, and so a lot of enterprises, you know, they've, 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 they've had these problems for a long time, right? They have these data security problems and they have teams and CISOs and there's, there's focus on this, right? So, they're not going to integrate that today. And so the skepticism is on par with the risk, I think, right now. And, and you know, the hair on the back of their hands or whatever is standing up. So, um, but if you think about perhaps industries or verticals where it's, where it's measuring the risk is harder, right? So if it's media or, you know, news, right, the, the margins are paper thin and the ability for an LLM to influence folks is very high. And it's hard for, for attribution to happen because the information is public and it's you know, kind of like all is out there in the ether. Um, I think that's that's kind of where I'm a little bit more fearful in the, in the near term is industries or verticals where the attribution and the, and the measurement's harder. But uh, I think a agents in themselves fundamentally is like where it's the end state of the risk for me because the loop will continue to be propagated um, and it will just oversteer into any direction, right? If the, the model can just use its own judgment. I, I definitely want to dive a little bit more into agents and sort of autonomy. I think in, in, uh, in the OWASP list, there was this idea of excessive autonomy. But just before jumping there, um, Kai, I'm curious if there's anything, you know, if you like this list, if you don't, if you think it accurately represents the sort of the top concerns that people should have, or uh, whether maybe there's some, some ones that are missing or some ones that, you know, that need to be a little higher on the list. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was on the team that made the list. There were many uh, heated debates. Um, at one point, there's, I guess there was a lot of um, debate surrounding prompt injection, I think also the most controversial entry of all of them. Um, I guess to, to represent the, the counter position, no. it's that you can't build an LLM without being susceptible to prompt injection and therefore it's uh, difficult to present that as a vulnerability, right? Because there's no clear remediation steps that address it to the point where you can say, oh, yeah, vulnerability is fixed. Yeah, it's remarkable. Now, right? It's an yeah. inherent risk. Um, but that also makes it, you know, still in my mind, uh, the most important entry. Uh, I'm, I'm also behind all of the other ones. I think they're important. Um, but uh, really, at the end of the day, the main thing we need to, uh, where, where many of these intersect is the alignment of language models, be it the robustness to adversarial misalignment or the initial alignment of the model itself, be it bias, confabulation, or paper clipping, right? Uh, all of these, I think, mm. uh, need to be taken seriously. And they lead us back to the idea, how do we get the model to do what we want and not what we say? Mm. Um, 
I want to I want to dive a little bit deeper into this one that, that Will brought just up brought up around uh, you know agents and I guess on the, on this list is you know mentioned sort of under the rubric of a, 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 a accepted agency right giving these these um, these LLMs a lot of power to act within the world to use tools you know use APIs both read from them and then to write from them. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, is ex extremely exciting for people that are kind of looking towards the future, particularly, is uh, in terms of the economic impact for these LLMs is to go beyond, hey, these things can write blogs, but no, you know, how far can we take them if they really become uh, incredibly capable, maybe not GPT-4, maybe GPT-5, 6, 7. Um, it seems like there's a strong pull to also give them more agency, give them the ability to act in the world, to work on our behalf. Uh, you know, and there's this idea of, you know, this, you know, the extreme idea of, you know, basically agents, you know, these autonomous agents, you know, writing software and doing all design work and, um, you know, taking care of patients, you know, that is in many ways, I think, what the end state is, as Will, Will said, for sort of the people that are sort of most enthusiastic or, or, or believe these models can, can go very, very far with capabilities. You're going to need to allow them to, to enable them with uh, agency in the world, I think, to, to have an impact. Um, and, and to realize the economic benefits uh, and the kind of the societal benefits that we, we want. Um, I guess, you know, well, like I'm curious on folks think, you know, is this, uh, you know, do we think we're going to go to that world? Is it possible or is security going to completely stop it? Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, Will, maybe we can start with, you know, you, just, you know, I know you're, you're thinking a lot about this. You're kind of very, uh, and, you, know, you think there's a lot of potential here from an economic perspective, but I guess is it all undermined in the end by the security concern? Well, I don't think it's undermined by the security concern because there, there's certainly people that think the value is so high that they squint at the mm. security problem. Um, and so that's the real crux of it. Even if most people are fearful of the outcomes here, um, there will be, always be folks that are kind of building towards that future. And, and I think it could be, uh, not to be doomerism, but doomerist, but like a little bit uh, like a WMD at certain scale. Um, but the... I th yeah, I mean, ultimately, if the agent is reasoning and incorporating new sources of information, and there's a real tension right now to have agents generate code. So it's not enough to say, oh, here's a couple of read and the APIs that you can incorporate and you can present some synthesis of that information. It's run in a loop. If you get stuck, reason about it and generate new code and integrate with the internet um, or you know, you know, ultimately people. Uh, that you're integrating with, then all bets are off. And if, the, you know, with a simple objective function, these models could, you know, even move from one environment to another, one runtime to another, um, and, you know, persist their own runtime without us getting to GPT-5, without us getting to GPT-6 or whatever, just with existing technologies today. Um, and so that does not necessarily have to be AGI, but you could envision a scenario in which you've got botnets, right? That are just self-perpetuating and then just a nuisance, almost like, you know, with these satellite garbage floating around the earth, you just have botnets that persist indefinitely because they're stuck in some kind of loop um, mm. and they're causing havoc. And that's the kind of more benign case, but it could also be much, much worse than that. And I think that's what makes me fearful about agents, but I'm not sure if it's a problem right now, but it, I think we will get to that point soon. Do I need agents for that? I have a couple of thoughts here I wanted to share. So, so um, you know, when we think about agency or excessive agency, we're talking about uh, functionality, permission, or autonomy that the, these technologies have to uh, work on our behalf or uh, collaborate on our behalf with other systems. And, um, you know, like th what, what I think, the, the analogy that I use here at Human is, you know, like, first of all, the boundary is dissolving. We talked a little bit about how, like, when you're defending SQL injection, all you have to find is code in the instruction that's input, right? And you say, that's not, that's not the way a human talks, uh, or that's not a username. We, we can stop that. Um, and that boundary is dissolving, right? As we look at LLMs that can process natural language, right? And take instruction and then act on our behalf with natural language. And so, you know, what really excites me and actually, you know, is what brought me here to human is like, if you compare this to like receiving a letter, right? You can look at the postmark, you can uh, inspect the uh, address it came from, you can look at the handwriting, but you, you have not observed 
the interaction where the letter was written. You didn't watch the guy with the pen writing the letter. And so for me, like as this boundary dissolves and as the ways in which what we receive become harder to differentiate between that, uh, which was like uh, received that came from a human or came from a bot, uh, I think what we need to start thinking about and doing is pushing where we uh, observe and make the decision uh, closer to that kind of uh, interaction where the, the human being, uh, you know, mm. is present controlling the computer uh, or the, that, that led to the initial input or, um, you know, the initial uh, request for agency, right? So if you can't stop or control the act of agency, you have to get closer to where the request for the act of agency occur. <laughs> You know, that's interesting. There's this, this, this sort of idea of trust, um, Kai. Uh, you know, I'm curious on, on your take on whether this sort of this, as we endow these uh, these LLM systems with more and more agency, you know, is, is this going to be solvable, right? Are, are we going to be able to, or even if it's not maybe solvable on the, you know, 100% reliability perspective, solvable in the way that we kind of are accepting in, in the human society, right? We can, in, you know, people aren't always reliable. They can, they can be susceptible to phishing attacks, but Maybe it's small enough that the benefit outweighs the cost, and um, you know, are, you know, are we in a world where uh, where LLMs maybe a year from now? It seems like today this is not the case from my perspective, but maybe in a year from now or two years from now, that we we will have a mechanism to figure out trust to trust. Hey, this is a something coming from a data source that we don't trust, and so let's not follow the instruction, you know, not follow the injection over there. Um, or are these models maybe you know uniquely susceptible, right? I've seen some incredibly clever uh, prompt injection attacks that seem like they're beyond maybe what is is uh, they, they could leverage uh, kind of cap in, uh, avenues of attack that are different than what humans uh, we have as humans. Uh, so yeah, I mean maybe you could just react to that. You know, is this you know how do you think about agents? You know, are we going to is there a path that we can uh, you know leverage them to get get the benefits that we want, or is this uh, and over what time horizon do you think we'll, we'll solve this problem or at least mitigate it to the point where the benefits outweigh the cost? As you mentioned, it's clearly possible, evident as human society is self-organizing and not falling apart. Um, however, we've had a lot of time in evolution to uh, be robust against attacks from our peers that have a roughly similar intelligence to us. In the computing mm -hmm. world, we are talking about huge, in, you know, huge uh, differences in compute. When an LLM makes a decision, it only has the compute to predict the next few tokens. When an attacker is optimizing an attack for that scenario, they can throw way more compute at optimizing a single input for that case. This imbalance will not necessarily go away, but I think we should take lessons. And this is something that I'm now specifically trying to promote. Uh, take lessons from how human society works and why uh, it works for us. I'm not sure if it's uh, similar to traditional security, but because I think the main reason is that humans are better black boxes. If humans work like language models and you could reset them into the same initial state and then deterministically sample the optimal, uh, well, you know, sample from the output and then optimize for the optimal input, right, to achieve some kind of desired output state. Um, and we're as accessible and observable, you know, every activation of our mind every activation of any neuron, I think we'd be facing similar issues. So we could be looking mm -hmm. at adding more population-based diversity to models that, you know, such that models aren't all the same, such that if an attack is found, it doesn't work for all of the models at one time, increasing the attack, the, the, the compute attackers need to develop one attack because now it's a, a single one for every model and, and so on, right? So I think in the limit, there's some inspiration we can take there. There's also plenty we can do eliminating non-robust features, uh, so-called, so that you know, if there is an injection, it at least is perceptible to us. So what the LLM perceives matches our own perception, such that there can't be any features that are smuggled in, right? I don't think that provenance of data necessarily help, helps us here, because if the malicious payload has been you know, retyped by a human and then put out there, um, that still makes it dangerous, right? Uh, it's not necessarily more trustworthy because it's uh, coming from a human. In a lot of other cases, it would, right? I just think in the specific case of uh, misaligning agendas to third-party information, it's more difficult. But, you know, if you can verify that it's a specific human, you know, that gives some accountability, that might help. Um, right. And it's about leveraging network effects to our advantage, trying to tilt the balance in our favor. 
Uh, right now, the favor is heavily in the on the offensive side, I think. And I'm hoping it changes. But if the last 10 years of adversarial examples in computer vision are any guide, uh, we will be gnawing at this problem for a while. And even if we sort of make it usable and get a lot of the utility that we're missing out on back, for a lot of the utility in the limit where we're automating entire companies and people and so on, uh, we'll need to be doing a lot of novel work. And I think it's going to take significantly mm. more time than it needs to scale these systems up to a point where they're already very capable. So I think you know we'll be at a point where GPT five or six can do a bunch of amazing things in isolation uh, and maybe even you know take over the world if you let it out. Uh, but it wouldn't be robust against these types of adversarial attacks after training during inference time. Right? No, that's, I mean, that's very sobering. And I, I like the perspective there around sort of the balance of power between the adversary and the defender and, and thinking about that, right? And the compute, uh, I, I've not heard the compute analogy that you use between inference and then the kind of the, the training these attacks. Uh, there's a kind of a compute imbalance, which is, uh, yeah, I can see that being, um, making it maybe harder than, than we would like on there. Um, I think a critical, critical area though, for people to be working on, uh, you know, identifying where these models can be used safely. I think part of that is to, you know, hey, where are the, where are the areas where they are, they are safe? Um, and the capabilities that we can expose to them and not be uh, overly concerned, the patterns about how we can, uh, uh, we expose them and aren't concerned. And then, you know, the longer term, I think, how do we solve this over the long term where we can do much more with these models, especially as they become um, more capable? You know, we have, we have six, seven minutes here. Um, you know, maybe we could, uh, if there's anybody in the audience who does have a question, um, please post it in the chat. I will take one, maybe one or two uh, questions, um, you know, in the last three or four minutes. Um, but maybe we can just kind of wrap it up with, um, uh, 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 you know, just a kind of a quick, quick, quick round robin here from from everybody. You know, if if there's a, you know, maybe a, a prediction that you have about the future, a call to action, a hot take, you know, something we think maybe we, we missed here. Hey, leave the leave the audience with sort of one one thought that hey, they should mull over this, uh, you know, uh, you know, as they as they go fall the fall asleep tonight, uh, or they work on the project tomorrow. Um, uh, and what, Frank, why don't I, why don't I kick it off with you? Um, and, and, and if you have one, and then I'll yeah. go to Kai and Will. You know, we, we talked about a lot of scary things, right? And, and so I, um, like I said, I think, uh, you can't stop progress, I think is the quote, but you could define what is and isn't progress. And so I think it's important for people to recognize that, um, you know, you, finding ways to use new technologies like LLM is a great thing. Uh, agency is is a great thing. I think as we kind of shared, the, the 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 boundaries are dissolving that we sometimes use to safeguard ourselves from risk, and so it's now really a question of where we can um, create new uh, boundaries or find new ways to um, you know uh, employ these technologies to our benefit. Uh, models guarding models. I think that's a great idea. I think if you um, uh, are exploring these technologies, understanding how models might um, be able to keep up with the input that uh, are a result of uh, uh, these this new landscape uh, is, is a really powerful idea as we think about defense in depth. But that really, I just wanna um, encourage people to find new ways to use um, new technologies. Uh, uh, and, and I'm speaking from, a guy, from the perspective of a guy that started with a 286. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 808 uh, for for me. So I got have to beat a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, Kai, um, yeah, I'm curious on if you have a sort of a, something you want to leave the audience with here, uh, or a or prediction for the future. Understand the threat model. It's not all about jailbreaking. It's not about uh, the woke police trying to you know censor responses from the language models. It's about real security. Yeah. And if you want to benefit from these models in the future, if you want to get utility for yourself as an end user or as a developer for, for your company, you have to understand the threat. Um, read our paper on indirect injections, read my blog, and uh, yeah. No, I think that's a great perspective. I know my own thinking, uh, particularly around prompt injection, has evolved dramatically. As I've, so I've read some of the work that you've done, and I've just thought about, you know, I think you can dismiss the, the, the naive ones where you meet the prompt, and then you think, wait, hold on, this is a much bigger problem than that, much more... Uh, uh, kind of existential to this whole kind of industry, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, I would understanding that threat model, the different attacks deeply. Uh, and then, you know, you're really pushing the envelope there in terms of new, new attack that I definitely not thought about. So uh, keep up, keep up the work there. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely subscribe to the blog, read some of the work that he's uh, written about before. It, it gives a great overview. And I think, Will, if you have a, 
uh, you know, maybe you haven't, most people I think have maybe have not thought as broadly about all the different attack vectors that exist there. Uh, Will, uh, just to, to kind of close us out here um, before I'll take one question, um, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I'd just leave folks with, um, I think Fat Frank's point is great. Like we should be having a positive outlook here and the technology is great. And, you know, we can build a lot of really powerful products that are very useful. Um, mm. To me, it's like the equivalent of fire being invented in some senses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for specific domains, there are techniques in which the risk can be isolated, right? If you build certain classes of applications, it's useful to meet with folks that are building similar software to you. So the rebuff project that we've got, we've got a Discord, we've got a community, you know, get involved and uh, try and understand the attack vectors. I think that's Kai's point as well. But you know, we should be building and integrating these models into our software. And you know, we're building agents and a company and a product based around that. So it's very top of mind for me. And I think the point of, you know, you can sit back and just let this happen, or you can shape it in the way that you want is very valid. Like we're trying to build agents in a safe way, we're trying to understand how do we, you know, do, do, does this mean we have local models? Do we have to have kind of clean rooms or, you know, isolated environments? How can corporations and individuals capture the value of the model without the risk, or at least minimize that risk? Um, and I think that's, it's, it's an interesting problem. And I think we'll all be benefiting from that um, over the coming years and hopefully without too much risk. That's a great hopeful perspective. I completely agree with you. It's like the invention of fire. Now we maybe need the fire pit, right? If we, didn't yeah. have, if we had fire without the fire pit, uh, we'd all be in big trouble. Um, so, uh, so, 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 so thank you everybody for, for, for hearing that perspective. We have two minutes left. So really quick, I did get one question here, which was very applied and actually kind of relates to maybe solving this problem, which is just, you know, are there any actual, you know, products out there on the market, open source projects that, hey, you know, I should, somebody in the audience should Google, uh, you know, in terms of maybe helping out with this. Um, uh, I'm curious, you know, well, I know you have the, the rebuff project, but is there anything else, you know, that you, that you would recommend people, people check out? That was a director at me. Um, sure, go go for yeah. it if you have any ideas. Yeah, you can plug, yeah uh, plug rebuff. Yeah. Well, re rebuffs one. I'd also encourage folks to have a look at Protect AI. They are doing a lot of interesting things, um, like uh, notebook and uh, supply chain related security vulnerabilities. I think uh, Frank Human probably has also a bunch of tools and things. Yeah, Frank, I mean, yeah, Frank. Since you're asking, <laughs> uh, you, know, like, you, mean, <laughs> you know, really, I, I, as I talked a little bit about like the sender versus uh, uh, inspecting a letter as you receive it versus uh, having a visibility as the request is made. Uh, that's really what has got me here at Human. I've sold RASP. I've been involved in WAF technologies. I've been involved in Endpoint and really cool, impressive companies. And uh, for me, uh, working some, being a part of something is, is a really about the, 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 the mission. And I, I really believe the closer you can get to the, the last hop, the hop from analog to digital, uh, where the human is actually, you know, instructing the computer to do something. And there always is that hop. If you trace the chain back, uh, the more you'll have the opportunity to, uh, you know, use these technologies for good. And that's what we're here doing at Human. Awesome. Well, with that, uh, I'll, I'll wrap things up. Uh, if you are in the audience interested in this topic more broadly, I mean, I would encourage you definitely check out what Human's doing. Uh, subscribe to you know uh, to, to Kai's uh, writing and, and follow what he's doing. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, very interesting material coming out over the next uh, months. And and you know, uh, Willem and the Rebuff Project. I know he has some other you know things cooking, um, uh, but follow along there. If you're building a kind of co-pilot for your own product, obviously uh, check us out at Continual. We're thinking about a lot of a lot of this as well. Um, so with that, I hope hopefully there was a few thoughts here that everybody uh, can take away with them. Uh, and thank you very much both to our uh, panelists uh, and to the audience.